sheep on a ship to Scotland. In June of 1945, the United States held 375,000 POWs. Under agreements negotiated during the war, the POWs were divided up and sent to England and to Europe as labourers. The British held German POWs for up to two years. The French kept them captive for another three years. POWs in the Soviet Union were not repatriated for eight more years. World War II had come to an end for the victors. To the vanquished, it wasn't over until POWs were free. With every mile of railroad track, I got closer to freedom. I sat in the Pullman car next to a guy named Otto Fredericks, who was born in Mannheim. He was 25, tall, strong and handsome, with a thatch of thick, straight, sandy-coloured hair. Otto possessed a booming bass voice. His favourite songs were the same as mine, Don't Fence Me In and Sentimental Journey. We sang them together at the top of our lungs and laughed as the train raced to New York. Otto and I played card games of scat and compared experiences in American POW camps. He told me he was a stonemason and that he had built a stone bridge while he was in his last camp. I built that bridge to last for a century. I hope someday I'll come back to see it, Otto said. That gave me pause. I couldn't think that far into the future. He wanted to come back to visit some day, and we weren't even home yet. Otto was more mature than I in other ways. I thought he was obsessed with the idea of finding the right woman to love. His green eyes grew brighter when he talked about it. If I can have a job, my own apartment, a wife and a child, I'll be perfectly happy, Otto said. He was a warm, outgoing type, and his disclosure struck a resonating chord in me. That's all I really want too, I blurted out. We jumped off the train when it halted in Fort Dix. I sniffed the air with gladness. Can you smell the sea? The Baltic Sea permeated my earliest childhood recollections. It made me relive wonderful memories. Harbours, beaches, boats and ships surrounded my hometown. I could recognise many types of seagoing vessels and identify their flags. A flood of fond memories washed over me like waves washing over a beach. I grinned from ear to ear. Did you hear when the ship is casting off? I asked Otto. He didn't share my enthusiasm. I'm not in any rush. I was so seasick, I couldn't eat anything on the two-week trip to America. Man, I sure hope it doesn't happen again, but I bet it will. We waited to board the ship that would take us home. I felt happy jittery excited. I looked around at my fellow POWs. Most were a few years older than I was. I envied how they kept their emotions in check. Now that we were nearly free, they seemed to be bracing themselves for the sea voyage and what they would find at home. I heard them express heart-rending worries. Even though they had been forced by the German government to go to war and leave their wives and children behind, they felt a deep sense of responsibility for them. I prayed that my mother, sister and father still survived. The wait in Fort Dix drove me crazy, and I, in turn, drove my fellow PRWs nuts with my pesky questions. Did you hear when we're leaving yet? I hung around the entrance of our enclosure. I wanted to be the first one on the troop truck that would deliver us to the wharf. Eventually, the trucks arrived and dropped us off at a pier. The ocean at last. My heart beat triple time when I laid eyes on ships rocking at their moorings. I noticed a troop transport being loaded. It had to be our ship. This is a big improvement, Otto, I shouted with glee. We were brought here like cargo in the hold of a freighter, but we're going back in the kind of ship that carried American soldiers overseas. Our boys will have a cabin this time, Otto, with berths and bathrooms and a mess hall. At least we'll travel like men instead of like rats in a hold, Otto said with a grimace. The ship is bigger, nicer, and I don't think you'll get as sick this time, I told him. I could see an American officer stride up to call us to attention. With an interpreter at his side, he told us the rules for prisoners on the ship. At the end of his instructions, he said, Good luck, men. Your lives since you were captured have not been easy. Your lives in Germany will be even harder. Your country is worse off than when you left. But I wish you the best. 
I expect you will land in Hamburg or Bremerhaven. He gave us the signal to board, and I shouldered my heavy duffel bag and ran up the gangplank so fast that I left everyone behind. I stood at the top of the gangplank and greeted our guys with a big grin, a formal German bow, and words of welcome as they came aboard. Soon after the last man reached the deck, we cast off. Otto looked up at seagulls wheeling overhead and asked, Did the officer say that our trip would take ten to twelve days? I thought it would be shorter this time because we won't have to be on a zigzag course to avoid submarines. Yeah, ten days sounds about right, but if we have bad weather it'll take at least twelve days. Otto shuddered. By evening he started feeling queasy and went below. He lay flat on his bunk unless the sea was calm. I stayed topside as much as possible. The cool salt air exhilarated me. As I stood at the rail... I noticed a tall, slender fellow sketching the ship. I went over to take a closer look and made his acquaintance. His rendering looked like the work of an accomplished artist. That's very good. What kind of work did you do in Germany? I asked. I was a draftsman. I really wanted to be an architect. Do you want to see the others? He flipped through the pages. Scenes from the Afrika Corps during rest breaks and the inevitable battle scenes came to life in his sketchbook. He introduced himself. I'm Werner Andersen. I'm from Hamburg. I was overjoyed. Hamburg, a large city on the Baltic Sea, was close to my hometown. I knew that sophisticated city very well. In pre-war days, my family had visited our Hamburg relatives there a lot. Werner's tall, slender stature, dark blonde hair, and blue eyes were typical of my people. He was a quiet, reflective type who, unlike me, thought carefully before he spoke. Nevertheless, we shared the excitement of the open sea. We were as happy as passengers on a pleasure cruise. Werner and I hung over the rail and scanned the horizon for changes in the weather, identified passing ships and the flags they flew. The blues and greys of the sea were a soothing change from the brown monotony of the camps. We could tell we were getting close to home by the familiar types of seaweed and jellyfish that floated by. We could almost taste our local delicacies, smoked eel and herring. As night darkened the waters, we told and retold jokes from the German lowlands and sang sailors' songs from the Baltic Sea. On the day we were scheduled to arrive in Germany, I rushed around on deck, trying to catch the first sight of my homeland. A cheer went up when I shouted, Land! I see land! Werner and I stood close to the bow urging the ship on. Out of habit, I looked over the side for the pilot boat. I could not believe my eyes. A boat marked Liverpool Pilot pulled alongside our ship. Look here, Werner, what's going on? Werner leaned over the rail and gasped. No, 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 none of the other POWs noticed. This isn't Germany, I screamed. I was mad enough to tear the ship to pieces with my bare hands. We're in England. Anxiety took over. Men rushed over to the rails to see for themselves. They could see that we were in the wrong harbour. A couple of guys shouted, I'm going overboard, but no one did. What are they going to do us? Werner wailed. Otto came topside when he heard the commotion and said, They can't do this. They told us we'd be free. I felt a gush of sweat as I tried to get ready for what lay ahead. What did the British plan for us? Visions of my homeland vanished. When I was able to get over the Americans' betrayal and think clearly, I heard Otto blurt out, We are not going home any time soon, boys. Everyone else groaned in agreement. I never asked to be a soldier. I've already been imprisoned three years for Hitler's crimes. How much longer can they hold us? I asked Otto as I tried to keep my voice from quavering. As long as they want, I'm as mad as you are, but it could have been worse, he said. They could have dumped us out in France or Belgium. I knew what he meant. I vividly remembered the abuse we suffered in the French-controlled camp in Oran. In retrospect, if the American camp commander had told us the truth, we certainly wouldn't have boarded the ship as unresisting as lambs herded toward the market, but as I thought about my frolicsome departure, I felt bitter gall rise in my throat, 
and I worked to suppress tears. I caught a glimpse of Werner huddled by the lifeboats. His shoulders shook as he tried to contain his grief. With a sinking heart, I watched our ship dock. Instead of our families in Germany, a massive contingent of British troops waited for us with fixed bayonets. The British expected a rebellion. They were fully prepared to control hundreds of unruly prisoners. Instead, by the time we disembarked, we had accepted the inevitable. We were still the same obedient, cooperative robots. Otto shouted, They may have beaten our country, but we are still honourable men. Show them that we still have courage. Bear up. This can't be any worse than what we went through in Africa. With painful pangs of disappointment, we stood up straight threw out our chests and shouldered our duffel bags. We marched down the gangplank with our duffels full of clothing, cigarettes, soap and other presents we had bought to give our loved ones. We stepped on the ground of a former enemy they wanted and needed their turn with us. If the British were surprised at our docility, they didn't show it any more than we showed our disappointment. They marched us to a huge camp with the usual barbed wire fences reinforced by concertina wire, I had thought we were past all that. I was so upset and nervous I was hyperventilating. Werner plodded along like a zombie. Otto said sharply, Calm down, Haino. Straighten up, Werner. They may have control over your body, but they can't control your head. Don't let them see how you feel. We approached a field and formed lines. A British officer addressed our contingent. You will be sent to small work camps to help our farmers. Our manpower is still on the continent in Asia and in the colonies. Many were killed in battle. You will be paid by the day when you work here. I translated this for the guys. I heard the men muttering. Chicken and cow manure. This is how we're finally degraded, Otto said. I don't know what to think, whispered Werner, swallowing hard. This isn't home, but they aren't going to kill us. I never thought that. I whispered back through gritted teeth. I just didn't know how they would use us. I hate to wait, and I hate surprises, I said. But that's all I've gotten since I was drafted. Endless waiting and nasty surprises. While we were still assembled, the officer warned us, Your belongings will be confiscated if you try to barter or sell anything. Our bulging duffel bags must have caused quite an impression. His instructions at an end... The officer spun on his heel and quickly walked away. I translated all the bad news to the guys around me. How long do we have to stay here? Werner asked. He was still in a struggle with his emotions. I tried to look nonchalant and shrugged. He didn't give me a chance to ask. The stern officer had given no clue as to how many years we would be held captive. Expressionless British soldiers pointed us toward a building where the familiar processing of prisoners began. The place was bare. Otto, Werner and I lined up. They assigned us new registration numbers. I tried to make my friends laugh by saying, Now, where the heck is the supply sergeant? I want sheets, towels and a clean uniform on the double. Otto chimed in. Yes, where's our duffel bag of new clothes? We could see a guy at the end of the line with stacks of folded cloth. He handed each of us two coarse canvas bags in army brown. What's this for? I asked a guard. The big bag is for your mattress, laddie, and the wee one is for your pillow. I stared at the brown canvas stupidly. He pointed toward the door. Now be good, lads, and take them outside to that pile of straw and fill them up. He said it all in the broadest of Scottish accents. I had to perk up my ears to understand enough to translate for the guys around me. They looked at me piteously. We shuffled outside and started filling up our bags. Otto looked down at his straw-filled pillow and said, I'll bet this is what their jailbirds sleep on. I filled mine up as fast as I could. It was going to be uncomfortable no matter what I did. Otto hurried too but he rammed twice as much straw into his bags and levelled them off in smooth rectangles. Werner took his time, picking out the softest stalks for stuffing. A guard posted by the straw pile motioned us toward our new barracks. When we got inside, another guard pointed out what we should do. The bags were to be thrown on top of wooden frames held together by steel bands. 
To lie on one of these hard, lumpy, bristly things was not much better than sleeping in a hayfield. We were given one blanket for the chilly climate. I hate being cold. I'll have to sleep in my overcoat. I heard other men grumble loud and long about the makeshift accommodations. This was a far cry from my comfortable army bed in America, which had a real mattress, a feather pillow, a comforter, and smooth cotton sheets. Even then, the American bed didn't match the quality in Germany feather beds, goose-down pillows, damask duvets, and sheets topped off with satin coverlets. Middle-class German guys like me slept like royalty until we were sent to war. Then we, the fabled Africa Corps, slept in dirt, sand and mud. I wish they'd shut up, I grumbled to Otto. Sure, we've gone through hell, but think about it. We could be sleeping the eternal sleep under African dirt. The memory of how close I had come to being buried alive by an American tank in North Africa was still fresh. Imprisoned again. At least I didn't have to watch out for Nazi elements. Even though I felt betrayed by the Americans, I was grateful that they culled the worst of the Nazis before they shipped us out. The POWs I met on the ship to Scotland were mostly politically uninvolved young men like myself, who had never voted and just wanted freedom. I secretly hoped that America would keep the Nazi criminals imprisoned for as long as they lived. America, how I missed it. I had carved a little niche there. I liked the breezy informality of Americans so much that I had started acting that way too. Americans were much friendlier than British or Germans. They had no equivalent for the formal sigh and rarely addressed anyone by title. Now I had to adjust to discomfort and to a culture as formal as that of Germany. In two years at Fort Knox, I had made a lot of American friends. I missed kidding around with the civilian workers and the supervisors at Post Engineers. I fondly remembered Mr. Ashley, who accidentally hired me and tried to talk me out of leaving so early. Perhaps he knew what was up. I missed seeing Mr. Knoll, my boss, and I missed joking with Brian, a corporal at the motor pool, who told me when I left that I learned to drive just like an American with one arm hanging out the window. Imprisonment in Great Britain was a drastic change, yet we had no choice but to make the best of it. Quonset huts on concrete platforms were our new homes. Sharp odours of coal and straw filled the air. A small stove was located in the centre. Although we were always cold in that rainy, chilly climate, we were not allowed to light a fire until late afternoon. The heating material was mainly coal dust. We hovered around the stove. I'm hot in the front and cold in the back, I moaned, until I turned around, warmed up my back, and my front got cold. The food was miserable compared to the US rations, even in 1945. In the morning, we had a bowl of watery oatmeal, at noon a thick slice of bread with cheese and a cup of tea, and at night a bowl of thin soup. What did I tell you, Haino? They make us sleep like jailbirds, and they feed us like jailbirds, Otto said. Prison fare, all right. I tried to figure out why. This must be a non-working camp, and we're getting non-workers' rations. I was hungry all the time. I scavenged garbage cans for potato peels. I ate them raw. I even bought rabbit snares from a Scotsman and used them to catch rabbits. My super-high energy burned up calories faster than the rest of the guys, it seemed. Even though I had never cooked anything in my life, I figured out how to roast the hares. I was preoccupied with food. When we began to get newspapers, we learned that the British food supply was much better and more ample than the food in occupied Germany. How can our families survive on less than this? I asked Otto. Otto shrugged and looked down, saying... I hope mine sell or trade everything I own to buy enough food. I nodded in agreement. Possessions don't mean anything to me anymore either. When I was still a kid, a bomb destroyed half of our apartment and damaged the rest, but at least none of us was hurt. Werner added thoughtfully. We had a close call when I was a kid. A bomb hit our building and forced me to see really quick the difference between important and unimportant. Mother and I had to dig our way out of our cellar. 
we were almost buried alive by the debris that fell on top of us. Idleness made us worry about our kinfolk more than ever. We were ready and willing when the British got organised and sent us to work camps in the countryside. Thirty of us at a time were carted off in lorries. My first work camp, Stranraer, tugged at my heartstrings. I could hear, see and smell the Irish Sea. I was closer to home than I had been in years. My new camp consisted of a few Quonset huts surrounded by a mere four-foot-high barbed wire fence. A British sergeant and a private slept in our camp at night as guards. Later, I was held in many other small camps in the Scottish lowlands, at Newton Stewart, Dumfries and Kilmarnock. I saw the towns of Ayr, Castle Douglas, Cumnock, Drummore, Kirkudbright, Stewarton and Wigtown. I even got to the beach near Glasgow. During my captivity, I worked on ten different farms. When we got paid, I figured out the rate of exchange in pounds and shillings. By then, I didn't expect much. Our pay was much less than in the United States. There we had earned enough for a few candy bars and soft drinks each day at the canteen. Our camp spokesman in Texas told us that the Americans uniformed us and paid us the same as their own soldiers. I was pleased to know that the Americans had treated me like they treated their own. Great Britain could not afford such largesse. Even so, we were paid the same as their soldiers. Scotland was so different from America. Each morning, a person from the Ministry of Agriculture gave us job assignments and a bicycle. He pointed on a map where to report for work. He let us know, with some pride, that the first bicycle was designed and built by a Scottish blacksmith and that a Scottish dentist invented the pneumatic tyres. The bicycles were old and battered, but I couldn't hide my pleasure. Riding a bike was another reminder of my life at home. For the first time in years, I had privacy, at least during my trip through the countryside. I felt virtually free. My only problem was getting used to bike riding on the left side of the road. I pedalled my bike and appreciated the quiet and the farm dogs that trotted along and kept me company. This was the most freedom I'd had since I was drafted. I savoured my independence even more than food. On Sundays, we could relax on the town square. Men, women and girls showed up in kilts and regalia and sang and danced to folk music played on fiddles and accordions. The music and dancing gladdened our hearts. We had grown up with regional folk music. But our former nemeses in North Africa, the bagpipers, sat on street corners and played for coins. The wheezy wine still triggered a swish of adrenaline in our guts. The pipers would never get a coin out of us. Otto, Werner and I were drinking tea outside at a cafe one Sunday and smiling at the girls when I blurted out, Girls don't want anything to do with me no matter where I am. I'm always dressed wrong. First, I was in a German uniform in Denmark, then in a US POW uniform in America, and now in an ugly black uniform here. I'm sick of being an outcast. I might as well be a leper. Otto responded to my outburst. Pretty girls won't give me the time of day either, and I'm a good-looking guy. We laughed at him as we ogled girls' folk dancing, bodies held straight as ballerinas, legs kicking gracefully. Their pleated plaid skirts rippled as they jumped between the blades of swords laid crosswise on the ground. Man, I really like pleated skirts, I said, as I watched the girls' skirts flip with leaps and turns. Otto couldn't stand it any more. Can't we go somewhere else? How much money have you guys got? We can go to the movies or to a soccer game. I had read entertainment notices in the camp. We threw our money together and came up with enough for a movie. From then on, we didn't try to mingle with the townsfolk. It was too discouraging. Instead, we looked for entertainment. One Sunday, when Otto, Werner and I ran out of money, we watched a game from high up in trees overlooking the field. We must have looked like big black crows. Someone from the town not he said us up there and invited us in. I was touched at the gesture. We sat in the stands watching a soccer game just like we used to at home. We felt like normal young men for a change. On one of my free weekends, I was a few minutes late getting back. A guard started threatening me about restricting future passes. If you Brits hadn't stolen my watch, 
I would have been here on time, I thought. In the past, I would have blurted it out. Instead, I could only bide my time and pray for the day I would be free. We never knew when or where bottled-up anger against us would reveal itself. When the pastor of the local Presbyterian church invited POWs to Sunday services, he didn't first ask his parishioners how they felt about Germans were shipping with them. He should have. Werner and I were just starting up the church steps when parishioners at the top of the stairs stared us down. They made it plain that they didn't want us there. We turned around and left before the service started. After that, we didn't try to go to church. Not even for Christmas until a Roman Catholic priest invited us to midnight mass on Christmas Eve 1946. Otto was thrilled because he was Roman Catholic. Werner and I wanted to be there, even though we were Protestants. I didn't know that the priest had invited a German POW with a fine baritone voice to sing the beautiful hymn Ave Maria. For the first time in years we were in a real church, a fine old Scottish kirk. Before my misting eyes, former foes, Germans and Scots, Catholics and Protestants, filled up the pews for worship. All my stress and worry left me as the Holy Spirit entered my heart and mind and gave me the most sublime feeling of hope and love, a soul-rending religious experience. Even today, the memory evokes the same feelings that comforted me that miraculous night. Many years later, I named my American-born son Kirk. After Christmas, the POWs seemed more relaxed and willing to adjust to Scotland. When the Scots realised how well we were cooperating, they gave us bigger and better rations. In the morning, we got a big bowl of oatmeal with sugar and milk. At noon, the farmers' wives served us the same hearty dinner they served their husbands. Sometimes we ate with the hired help. At other times, we were served separately. The scene reminded me of my easygoing sister Erica's description of her land yard, when she and other teenage girls were ordered off to work on German farms. She didn't mind the hard work, and she liked the fresh food and excellent cooking in the country. The plain menu served to us was far from gourmet, but it was filling. Boiled potatoes, turnips, or carrots slathered with cream gravy, and a hunk of boiled mutton or chicken were typical meals. I heard men complaining about the quality, but I was glad to just be replete. I felt like my old self again, especially since I was finally in contact with my family. The representative of the International Red Cross let me complain about the aggravating situation regarding letters to and from our loved ones. I told him that I hadn't received any mail since the end of the war in May of 1945. I said that I was one of many POWs punished for refusing to sign cards handed out by the Americans that stated, A former member of the beaten Wehrmacht is searching for his next of kin. He gave me a non-incriminatory Red Cross card to sign so that I could get mail. I waited for it with my usual impatience. Grief, not joy, throbbed through my heart as I read my first letter from home. I'm sorry to tell you this, dear Haino, but after our shoe shop was bombed out, your Uncle Hanny got so depressed that he couldn't even eat his reduced rations. He died of malnutrition last Sunday. When I ripped open my second letter, I was overjoyed to find that my parents and my sister Erica had survived the bombings and strafings. My father had remained in the police. Erica had been in the German Air Force, similar to the US WAX. She joined a group that fled from the island of Rugen in the Baltic to Czechoslovakia and on to Bavaria. She was briefly a US POW. She returned home on a coal train, since no civilian train service existed. My mother wrote that Erica looked so funny when she emerged from the train covered in black suit from head to foot. I was happy that she was home safe. She had even given them something to laugh about. Her duties were over. Yet for me, there was no end in sight. My sister knew more about farm work than I did. I had never been on a German farm, let alone a Scottish one. Except for my short stint with Mexican migrant workers in the onion fields of Texas, I had no experience. Now I was expected to pitch in with every task. Scottish farmers laid aside their animosity toward Germans and were glad to have another pair of hands. 
They trained up on your foot, laddie. It will blacken your nail, they cautioned. But it happened once, and I hobbled around for a week. Watch those horns, laddie, the farmers warned. They can put your eye out. I gave the long, curved horns a wide berth. I tried to talk to the cows to keep them calm. Scottish border collies fascinated me most. Farmers bragged about their dogs and told me that they were the smartest on earth. I didn't doubt it when I saw the dogs at work. The farmers could send a pair of them out by themselves to bring home the cows. When sheep needed to be brought in, I got to see the collies in action. They crouched unseen in the grass until they jumped up to chase after wayward sheep. They followed directions from their masters, who used hand signals or whistles. The farmers were lucky to have such smart and cooperative dogs, and the help of obedient POWs. Farmers taught me to use a milking machine on the cows, to dock the tails of lambs, and to shear the sheep. I learned to harness horses to two-wheeled carts and to bring in hay, barley and oats. I dug thousands of potatoes, toddies, from the cold earth. My frost-bitten hands grew huge. On the cold and windy Scottish moors, I used a unique device, a peat cutter, to slice thick, carpet-like rectangles of peat to fuel Scottish hearths. Loneliness was ever-present, but life for the time being felt safe and uncomplicated. At night, our two Scottish guards would occasionally check to see that all of our bunks were occupied. I thought that this was rather unnecessary until I learned that some of the older powers actually managed to find Scottish girlfriends. I wondered where they found women who would want them. The men were dressed just as badly and were just as poor as the rest of us. The Romeos cleverly stuffed their mattresses with more straw in the shape of a man while they were out. Still too shy to approach a girl, their nocturnal trysts were something I could only dream about. I didn't expect to get to know a girl until I was back in Germany. On one farm, when I introduced myself to the Brown family, I had no reason to suspect that I was in for plenty of romantic complications. Bob Brown was a large, dark haired capable man around 40. He and his wife had a daughter, Tamara, who was my age. She was just leaving for work, a bonny lass with pretty chestnut hair bobbing as she bicycled down the lane. I watched her leave, rather wistfully, I'm sure. My expression was probably not lost on her mother, Betty, a slender brunette in her late thirties. She looked at me as no other woman had looked at me before. I bowed and shook her hand, since I was a polite German boy. But I trembled. When Bob motioned for me to join him in the barn, I felt relieved. I stepped inside the building. Ach, I said, hopped outside and held my nose. The stench of urine and manure nearly knocked me over. Bob laughed at my reaction. Don't worry, you'll get used to it, lad, he said. Little did I know that one of my jobs would be to shovel out the barn. I got used to it. Bob demonstrated the use of his milking machines and pointed out which cows were to be milked. After several days, he was satisfied that I could manage. He left, saying that he was headed for a far-off field. Suddenly, Betty appeared in rubber boots, reaching around me and trying to help. She giggled as my hand brushed hers. I could feel her breath on the back of my neck. When I whirled around, she pretended that she lost her balance, and I had to catch her before she fell into the manure trough. She put her face in mine and said, You're handsome. I love your blue eyes. I thought she must be crazy. When my chores were done, I hopped on my bike and tried to make sense of what had happened as I pedalled back to camp. I was so embarrassed that I didn't tell anyone. Within a few days, I was sent there again. By this time, Betty had figured me for the blushing, bumbling youth I was. She replaced her rambunctious behaviour with a calm and sweet demeanour. She looked pretty. I hoped that this was her way of being friendly. She told me what a good job I was doing and how happy she was to have a young, strong man about the place. She hugged me. Never having been touched like that by a woman before, I felt new, spine-tingling sensations. That day, I pedalled away, singing. The gloomy road I trundled to the farm now seemed a bright and easy path. I hadn't felt so good in ages. The next time I pedalled to the brown farm, I felt thrills of anticipation. I couldn't wait to sit next to Betty and to chat with her after the chores were done. 
private talks with females were a rare treat. Betty gave me several kisses on the cheek, then peeked to see how I was handling it. I was putty in her hands until she pounced on me in the haymo. She planned her manoeuvre well. Her husband wouldn't be home for hours. Conflicting thoughts went through my head. I wasn't sure what she was up to. Was she planning on adultery? While these thoughts clanged in my head, another thought took precedence. I had escaped the war practically unscathed. How ignominious it would be if I were killed or injured by a jealous husband. I lurched out of the haymow like a bumbling boy, feeling Betty staring hatefully at my back. My bicycle carried me to my camp, where I vowed I would never return to the brown farm. Now, I could see how POWs got their girlfriends. From then on, I switched jobs with other POWs and tried to forget about Betty. Farm work was exhausting, but I tried for larger farms with other men, where there was a spirit of camaraderie that I liked. Luckily, I met up with Otto and Werner again. Let's see who can get done the fastest, I would say. Otto was stronger, but I was quicker. Werner always tried to think of other ways to do the work. Sometimes his experiments exasperated me, but sometimes they were an improvement and we did it his way. Pretty soon the rest of the POWs got into the spirit of the contests. We found out who could pick the most potatoes, who could cut the most peat, and who could shear the most sheep. The excitement made the day go faster. The Scots enjoyed watching us. On their rest breaks, they singled me out for entertainment because I spoke a cultured schoolboy English. They tried to get me to pronounce Scottish words. They would say, Repeat after me, laddie. It's a brubrecht moonlecht tonecht. I had no trouble with their throat clenching sounds. German has a lot them. Most Scots tried to trip me up with the name of a tiny town. Say this one, laddie, Ochter Muchti. I could pronounce it, much to their amazement. It's now the middle name of my Scottish-bred Golden Retriever. Scots, Pows and Irishmen looked forward to an hour's rest for dinner. During harvest time, farm wives served bounteous meals. I ate and chatted with Irish migrant labourers who went from place to place just as the Mexican migrants do in the United States. The Irish weren't treated any better than the Mexican labourers here. Their beds were worse than ours. They stretched out on potato boxes in the barns. When I first met the Irishmen, I toyed with the idea of escaping to the Irish Republic. Some of them offered to help me. They didn't like the British, but they worked in Great Britain because they needed the money. When I proposed my escape plan, Werner told me point blank, I've already had all the excitement I can stand. Count me out. Otto was all for it, but he got cold feet the night we were ready to escape. I don't speak much English. What if we get stranded somewhere? We could be thrown in jail. That would have been the last straw. Otto was right. Soon afterward, I knew from letters and newspapers that my home city was under British occupation. They would have questioned my return from Ireland rather than from the United Kingdom. Little did I know that freedom was just around the corner about 18 months after our arrival in the United Kingdom. We heard the rumour that German POWs in England were dropping leaflets from trucks on the way to their jobs, stating, Britain, send your slaves home, the war is over. I kept an eye out on the roadsides. I wanted to see one of those leaflets myself, but I never found one. Although we had no connection with other camps, this idea seemed to be spreading and I believe it turned the British public opinion in our favour. Finally, by 1947, preparations to send us home began with a reclassification of German POWs. Once again, we were organised into groups. Group 1, White. Men with proven membership and activity in pre-Hitler Democratic parties. Group 3, Black. The SS, identified by their blood groups, A, B or C, tattooed under their arms. Group 2, grey. Politically indifferent. The majority fell into this group, including my friends and me. Our group was subdivided based on length of captivity. I was in group number 12, 
the North African campaign. Airmen, submarine and other naval personnel captured earlier were in groups 1 to 11. This time it was for real. I was sure of it. Yet others were not as trusting. Some of them couldn't stop throwing cold water on my excited chatter. What makes you so sure? sneered an old guy of about thirty named Gerhardt. This could be another plot to enslave us somewhere else. Why are you so suspicious? I asked him. I'm not, I'm a realist, hissed Gerhardt. I ignored him, I was so excited I could hardly stand it. I was twenty-three years old and had been gone from home for more than five years. We greys with low group numbers were sent back to the same camp in Liverpool, where we had our surprise landing in March of 1946. They called us, assembled us, herded us on trucks, ordered us off the trucks and loaded us onto a train under heavy British armed guards with fixed bayonets. I whispered to Otto, Are they crazy? Why would we try to rebel or to escape now? When we disembarked at Peterborough, near London, a lone RAF, Royal Air Force, guy appeared. He was unarmed and kept his hands in his pockets. I translated his orders. He said, just line up and follow me. I rolled my eyes at Otto. Does anyone in charge know what they're doing? Otto muttered. The RAF man led us to a deserted barracks that held beds and the ubiquitous little stove in the middle of the room. Low mutterings became louder and more intense. One of the men angrily looked over at the RF guy and yelled, What's this all about? What's going on? Then I spoke up in English and tempered his words a little. Are we supposed to work for the RAF now? No answer. The RAF man casually turned his back on us and ambled out the door. No one could sleep that night. Bitter old guys like Gerhardt ranted and raved and sounded homicidal. My buddies and I turned our backs on them. We looked out the windows and talked our problem to death. All we could really do is wait for an RAF officer to show up. The next day, one appeared. I expected him to tell us we would be leaving right away. Instead, he started talking about our work assignments. I snapped to attention. What? What's he talking about, Haino? Otto swore under his breath. What a blow! I looked at Werner. If he'd had a gun, I think he would have killed himself. My old heckler, Gerhardt, was standing right behind me. See, I told you so. There was a lot of mumbling among our men. Are we betrayed again? I wondered. I got up my courage to raise a question. Why were we shipped here after we were scheduled for discharge? The officer said, Really? I'll check into the matter with your old camp, I promise. When he left, I translated his words to dejected ears. Total disillusionment radiated through the barracks. We were in for another restless night. Otto, Werner and I couldn't stop talking about it. Someone just made a mistake, that's all, I said, trying to convince myself as much as Werner. He was overcome, sitting with his head on his knees. We should have made a break for it when we could, Heino, Otto said quietly. I could hear the babble of men's voices arguing over what they had just heard. I felt used and betrayed. Our black garb felt like mourning. All of my excitement and enthusiasm was stripped away like the wool I sheared from Scottish sheep. After lights out, I felt meek as a lamb. I put my fate in God's hands. The officer finally came back the next day. He stood stiffly before us to announce, You are not supposed to be here. There has been some kind of error. I grinned from ear to ear, hopped up and down, and watched Otto and Werner when I translated his little speech. I thought I heard a communal exhale. I grabbed Otto and pounded him on the back. Congratulations, we're free at last. We grabbed Werner and thumped him too. I saw other hugs and hearty backslaps. This had to be it. True to his word, the officer organised us for departure. A large group of us was sent by train to the camp we had passed through twice, once upon arrival and once after leaving the work camp in Scotland. Soon afterward, we joined a second group for another train ride, to the port of Horwich in Essex, England. Now all the POWs believed that we were really going home. Even Gerhardt, the heckler, looked pleased. 
From there, we were ferried across the North Sea to a port city of the Netherlands, Hook van Holland. At that point, we were transferred to the familiar German freight cars for the trip into Germany and a discharge camp in Munster Lager, near Lüneburg. This was a former German army camp taken over by the British Army of the Rhine. At this time, August of 1947, it was a military discharge point for German soldiers. Men who'd been mustered out handled our military discharge. Otto, Werner and I shook hands in the early morning of a late summer day, saying we'd meet again. It never happened. We didn't fully comprehend the silent battle of Servival that Reged in Germany. A grim free-for-all fought by every man, woman and child. We joined our families in the fiercest struggle for enough food, a roof over our heads and a change of clothes. The deprivation went on for years and took its toll on our psyches. In a final flurry of plaid kilt, a Scottish officer signed my discharge. Then one of our German ex-soldiers handed me a small discharge allowance. This is for your bus fare home, and here's a little package of food for your trip, a loaf of bread and a can of corned beef. It's not much after what everyone's been through, he said, but it should get you home. Goodbye and good luck. I counted my marks, roughly three and a half dollars American. One dollar for each year of my captivity. Freedom, I needed to stop and thank God for my deliverance through seven countries. My faith and my intuition had guided me toward the right decisions at the right time. Another thought took shape. God had sparred me for reasons only he could know. I heeded toward the British truck that was pointed out. I realised I would be home before dark. About an hour after the truck left Munster, I jumped off at the town from which I left for North Africa, Lübeck. Once a medieval city of fairy tale romance and charm, it was barely recognisable. Cataclysmic bombings had razed the city, leaving only the ancient city hall and the fabled Holston city gate, embellished by twin peaked caps. They stood like sentinels over the apocalyptic city. Like the city, I was no longer the same. Provincial, innocent and naive, I had been forced into the mould of a sceptical, sarcastic, fearless man. I no longer respected Germans in authority. From Lübeck I boarded a German postal bus to Kiel. The trip took about two hours. I looked grimy. My only clothing was my threadbare, black-dyed US Army uniform. I'd worn it every day for farm work for a year and a half, and I despised it. A realisation hit me. I had obeyed my last order. I was a civilian and an adult. I could do anything I wanted within my meagre resources. My first decision was the same one that had been on my mind since leaving Germany, to find my family. Although we corresponded without censorship while I was in the United Kingdom, I didn't really know how they had fared. It was obvious that their letters were written solely to cheer me up. They didn't mention any problems, like many families of POWs did. My mother ended each letter with blessings and Auf Wiedersehen, until we meet again. My folks were not aware that I was back in Germany and on my way home. I wondered how they were faring. Was Nietzsche right? Was dich nicht umwirft, macht dich stärker. What doesn't kill you will make you stronger.